Hi, everyone. Welcome to the 13th episode of the Farm Chatter series on Shop Sites Feet. On this episode of this series, I spoke with Professor Elisheva Kalbach, and we discussed her book called The Pursuit of Heresy, Rabbi Moses Hajiz and the Sabatian Controversies, which is about Ramosha Hajiz, or as you may know him as Ramosha Hagiz, um, and his role in the, uh, especially in the controversy around the Chem Yechion, and uh, other Sabatian controversies, and then culminating in the Ramchal uh, controversy. So we discussed uh, all of those issues and more. Uh, once again, I would like to thank the corporate sponsor of the series, Gluck Plumbing, for all your service needs, big or small in New Jersey, with a full service division, from boiler changeouts, main sewer line snakeouts, cameraing main lines, to a simple faucet leak, Gluck Plumbing Service Division has you covered. Give them a call, 732 732- 523-1836, extension 1. That's 732-523-1836, extension 1. And as always, if anyone has any questions, uh, comments, or feedback, or would like to sponsor an episode, please email me, sfarmchatter at gmail.com. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the Sfarm Chatter podcast and another episode in the ongoing Shop Say Sweet series. Uh, on this episode of the podcast and the series, I will be joined by Professor Elisheva Kalbach, who teaches Jewish history at Columbia University. And we will be discussing Ramesha Chagiz, or Chagiz, and who was the subject of her book called The Pursuit of Heresy, Rabbi Moses Chagiz and the Sabatian Controversies. And we'll be discussing him and his role in the, in the controversy. So thank you, Professor Kalbach, for joining me once again. My pleasure. So let's start off about, uh, I, I get to about Ramosh Hajiz, but before we even get into him, um, what, how did you draw, what, what drew your attention to him and that you decided to write this book all those years ago? So at the time, I was a graduate student and Gershom Shalom's Shabtai Tzvi had just come out in English uh, in the Verblovsky translation. It really electrified Jewish academics all over the world. And in, in Shabtai Tzvi, which I recommend to all your readers, Shalom romanticized Shabtai Tzvi and his followers and made them out to be the true creative spirits in Jewish history that only sometimes erupted to the surface. The rabbis, with Rabbi Yaakov Sasportas, uh, as the primary opponent of Shabtai Tzvi in Shabtai's lifetime, Shalom dismissed as like inquisitors. He called uh, Rabbi Yaakov Sasportas like a grand inquisitor. And there was something that disturbed me greatly about that portrayal of the opponents of Shabtai Tzvi, since after all, history vindicated them. And I realized that the stakes of this discussion were very high. Who gets to determine what is normative and what is marginal in Jewish history? What we admire and what we feel um, deserves to be marginalized. Um, again, what the mainstream and what sectarian is. Uh, there was a critic who uh, reviewed Shalom Shabtai Tzvi, who said, Baruch Kurzweil, he said, Shabtai Tzvi is not a new history of messianism. It's a new history of Judaism. And that really summarized for me what was happening here. Shalom was attempting to completely revise our understanding of the past. And I felt that in my small way, I would uh, try and rectify that. So from there, why did you decide that Ramesh Chagiz or Chagiz was he was someone that he was distinctive enough life that you were going to work on, write a you know research and write a biography on him? So um, actually, I first thought to write about Rabbi Yaakov Sasportas. I'm glad I didn't because uh, Professor Jakob Dweck has done a magnificent job. Uh, but it was that my then uh, doctoral mentor, Professor Yerushalmi, who pointed out uh, that the scholar Meir Benayahu, uh, who was the son of uh, former chief Rabbi Yitzhak Nisim, had written a series of bibliographic essays on Rabbi Moshe Chajiz. Uh, he had already um, found every printed work and every haskama that he'd written, every uh, line that ever came off his pen was already there 
um, and almost nobody had heard of him. Uh, and it just seemed to me that that here was another excellent example of a certain trajectory in which a um, Levantine Sephardi rabbi who comes out of uh, the Middle East, in the case of Hajiz, he was born in Yerushalayim, in the case of Sasportas, he was born in North Africa, and they're coming into Western Europe and seeing a completely different culture, a completely different world, uh, one whose values are very different from the ones they remembered. And uh, since it was a similar trajectory, I decided to uh, work with Hajiz. Okay, so first of all, I'll just mention for the listeners, now we'll call him, his name, his name was Ramesh Chagiz, not Chagiz. Everyone sees his name, they assume probably Ashkenazic name was Chagiz. Um, so let's talk about him, you know, just his background first to start off, you know, when where, when he was born, where he lived and where he was from, his rebellion and so on. Okay, so um, here's somebody who lived in the last, from the last quarter of the 17th century, he was born in the 1670s in Yerushalayim. Uh, where his father, Rabbi Yaakov Hajiz, um, who himself had traveled uh, to various parts of uh, especially Italy, but uh, ended up in Yerushalayim, where he was the head of a Hezger, uh, which is kind of like what we would call a kolel, I guess, um, uh, where chachamim, mature scholars, uh, would be um, supported in their study of Torah. And uh, that was his that was his original uh, background. Uh, his father died when he was rather young, so he was raised by his maternal grandmother, Rabbi Moshe Galante, uh, who then also headed the yeshiva, and uh, to whom he uh, owed great devotion. He uh, spoke of him very warmly and highly, and. Um, Again, who, who exactly his rebellion were, he doesn't always say, but this was the milieu in which he was raised. Okay, so then he was in Yerushalayim, but, and we should you know go on a little further, he obviously doesn't stay there. He ends up traveling. I mean, where, why does he, do we know why he leaves Yerushalayim and where does he end up going from there? So apparently there was a tremendous amount of discord within that yeshiva in Yerushalayim between uh, followers of Shabtai Tzvi, or so it was uh, alleged, uh, and the the Saspor and the uh, Hajiz clan over control of this yeshiva, and ultimately uh, Moshe Hajiz had no place there. Uh, he was a, a young man when he left, 17, 18 years old, uh, and he decided to go to Italy. Um, for various reasons, one of them being that was the place where you could get your manuscripts printed. Um, he and he took many manuscripts with him, including um, those of his own father, uh, the Halachot Katano, famously, and and several others, and and his own work eventually. Uh, so Venice was one of the hubs for Jewish or Hebrew printing at that time, uh, and that's where he makes his way okay so now we should i guess skip ahead a little bit to the key part of the story how he becomes a uh i think you term it in your book a professional zealot or someone else terms it that way or a heresy hunter whatever he, he ends up getting involved in broil a little bit later in sabatianism skipping ahead a little bit I mean, how how does this come about and how does he get involved in all of this Okay, so as I said, he's not coming with a complete uh, tabula rasa or blank slate. He has a background in which uh, people who apparently were uh, loyal Shabtaim were trying to take control of Yerushalayim and some of its institutions of, of Torah learning. And this was very disturbing to him. Uh, I should also say that uh, his father had been a Rebbe of Natan Ha'azati, Nathan of Gaza, who was the prophet, uh, the, the herald of, of Shabtai Tzvi and, and his interpreter. And I think it's much harder for a Rebbe to believe that his student became the Mashiach uh, or, the, or the Navi who prophesied the Mashiach uh, than most other people. Uh, so it's, it's pretty natural to understand why uh, 
why Rabbi Moshe Chaji's father, Rabbi Yaakov Chaji's, was an opponent of, of Shabtai Tzvi and all things Shabtai. Uh, he, he understood it to be the product of a disturbed mind, um, a distortion of Kabbalah, uh, something that, that's preying upon um, people who are very eager for Yemot HaMashiach, uh, but he just didn't see this at all uh, as a plausible candidate. And his son inherits that stance from him. So that's a kind of background. Um, in, in some time now, there's also some suggestions uh, that Nechem Yechia Chayon, uh, who, who was also some, from somewhere in the Middle East, it's not clear. He claims provenance from uh, from Tzfat, from Alexandria, uh, from other places. It's not exactly clear where he was born, uh, but he may have been involved in some of the controversy to divert funds away from the Chaji's yeshiva, in which case there may have been more of a personal element here, possibly. Uh, but the stakes of the controversy uh, were clear. In 1713, it wasn't the first publication. He published a small book in 1711 uh, in which he outlined some of his ideas. No one paid attention to it. It got many prestigious haskamot. Uh, I, I would like to add that Rabbanim who lived in cities that had printing presses were often overwhelmed with manuscripts and with authors coming from all over the world uh, seeking their haskama so that they could print it. Um, and this is what happened to the first work uh, that Chayon published. It was called Raza di Chuda. He published it in Venice in 1711. It was a small little work and it gained absolutely no attention. Nobody paid attention to it, even though it already um, foreshadowed everything that was going to follow in his next major work. But then two years later, in 1713, he goes to Berlin, which also had a Hebrew printing press. And there he published a much lengthier work. Um, and I want to uh, just say a word to the listeners. The title of the work was Oz Lelohim Ubeit Kodesh HaKodashim. Because Chayon's conception of God is not the Jewish conception, um, one could possibly argue that, that it is idolatrous. Um, I don't pronounce it as though it is a Kodesh term. Um, that sounds disturbing, and it was to me originally, but it's even more disturbing to think of Chayon's description of the divine as um, the normative Jewish one. Uh, so that's that's the way I worked, worked it out. Uh, if anybody has a better suggestion, I'm interested to hear it. Uh, in any case, there's no question that Chayon's book, which claimed to be, it, it's a it's, uh, arranged almost like a page of the Gemara, where there's a little bit of the main text and then two surrounding commentaries. The commentaries were both written by Chayon, and the primary text he claims were Shabtai Tzvi's own words in which Shabtai is teaching the secret of the divine nature. Um, now, uh, as it turns out, this was false. Uh, Professor Yehuda Liebes showed uh, that it was not the work of Shabtai, but it was in fact uh, a work written by um, Avraham Michael Cardozo, uh, about whom there is a wonderful biography uh, by David Halperin. Uh, Cardozo was one of the most important disseminators of the Torah of Shabtaut after the lifetime of Shabtai Tzvi. So he was the one who was the author of this work that Chayon is disseminating. But when it was printed, nobody knew that. Everybody took it for that face value. Here for the first time in history, someone had the chutzpah. So he was really the Poretz Geder in a certain way of printing, bringing to print 
Shabtai's heretical teaching, that's what they thought it was, about the nature of God. Um, and it was that shock to the system, so to speak, the fact that he dared bring it into the open. And um, in a very interesting, you could see it on HebrewBooks.org, um, even those who are not interested in his theology should read his Hakdama, his introduction. It's quite long, um, but it's quite breathtaking, again, in what seems to be his audacious turnaround or turning inside out of what seem to be very clear guidelines. Uh, so when Chazal say, you know, don't study um, secret matters, you know, not when there's three and Masse Merkava and only two and only one. He says, well, I, I'm not studying this with anybody. There's nothing more quiet than a single person reading a work to himself. And therefore, I'm allowing each person to hold a copy of the book and to study it biachidut alone by themselves. Um, again, it, it's quite striking how how dismissive he is of, of the norms and conventions that had prevailed until then uh, around the teaching of Kabbalistic material in general, uh, but Shabtai Kabbalah in particular. And that's what, it, it was the appearance of that book that I believe turned, or I should say triggered uh, the, the zealousness in Rabbi Moshe Chajiz, who realized that until that time, so uh, from the 1680s, when there had been one tremendous shock in the Jewish world, uh, when followers of Shabtai Tzvi in Salonika in, the, in 1683, a whole bunch of them, a whole community converted to Islam in the wake of Shabtai Tzvi's conversion. As, as an imitatio, an act of imitation of Shabtai Tzvi. Um, after that time, it seemed as though who could possibly want to be a follower of a Messiah who turned out to be not only false, but was leading Jews into Islam. It seemed so far out, so far-fetched, so radical, um, and so wrong that it didn't seem as though there was any need for any rabbinic stamp of disapproval. I mean, the movement seemed to have disproven itself. And then along comes Chayon, and it made, it made the opponents of Shabtaut realize that it had actually been percolating under the surface all this time. Uh, it was spreading very broadly. Um, it was ensnaring young yeshiva students, uh, as well as uh, veteran Talmidei uh, Chachamim and people particularly who were interested in the byways of Kabbalah. And he felt that, he, that the, the conspiracy of silence or the strategy of silence and the hope that it would just die a natural death wasn't working. And they had to come out in a much more public and forceful way. Okay, so a few things. First of all, um, regarding David Halpern's the biography of Cardozo, so listeners can check out the, episode, the previous episode of him I did in the series with, uh, with him, and as well as, an, and you mentioned the Donme who converted, so I did an episode with uh, Professor Cengiz Sisman. Listeners can check that one out also if they haven't heard either of those. And also regarding Chion's works, I'll, I'll put a link in the uh, show's notes that people can check out on Hebrew books, his, uh, like you said, the, read the introduction. So we'll get more maybe back at him in, in a minute. So he publishes this work. So now Ramosh Khajiz decides to, like you mentioned, he has to come out in the open. He has to go and he has to attack him. So what, what happens there? And then we get the Chacham Svi's involvement. What happens from there? Uh, so it begins as, as a series of letters which go out to um, various Rabbanim in, in key places, uh, some Ashkenazic, mostly Italian and Sephardic, uh, asking them to join him in a ban um, against, against Chayon. Um, it, it was a quite public um, 
con- and, and and what happens is that uh, several of the several of the rabbanim are reluctant to have open controversy. It wasn't so much that they wanted to protect Chayon, uh, but they wanted to protect Klal Yisrael from another generation of controversy. Um, and this is particularly true in Italy, uh, where it seems that many of the people who really sympathized with Chajiz's stance, they, they didn't approve of Shabtaot, but they even more strongly felt uh, that Shalom was, was a value uh, that was more important, uh, that that lay people and simple people don't understand what the stakes are in these rabbinic controversies. All they know is that the rabbis are insulting one another, banning one another, um, and it ends up, they believe, in more of a chilul Hashem uh, than allowing one heretic to peddle his books. Uh, and so uh, it was a really uh, difficult split uh, and that's that's why it became a controversy. Right. You mentioned Italian Rabbanim. I mean, there's a number that you discuss in the, it's discussed in the book in depth that people can check. It would be Briel or Briel, Shish Morpurgo, Joseph Irgas, or Davin Nieto in, in London. And then obviously yes. the uh, the Chacham Tzvi, who was, who was at that time in Amsterdam, he was the Ashkenazic chief rabbi. He gets involved with Moshe Chajiz, who I believe it was in Amsterdam at the time. And they uh, get involved and there was a whole, uh, you know, fight or whatever between them and the uh, the Portuguese community there. Yes, because the Portuguese community in Amsterdam was led by a rabbi uh, who apparently was a secret Shabtai sympathizer, uh, Chacham Shlomo Ailon. And again, there, there are so many hidden agendas and uh, many, many of these names that you mentioned uh, were really Gedole Chachme Italia. Uh, when you think about uh, Rabbi Shimshon Morpurgo, he was also a doctor um, whose Shelot Uchuvo Shemesh Tzedaka are um, very interesting. And uh, he was extremely learned. And you can see from his replies to Hajiz that he doesn't deny the correctness of his position. He just doesn't want to engage too much in polemic. He, he thinks that's going to drag everybody down um, and and he's very careful um, not to be too caught up in it. So this becomes a, a challenge for Hajiz, who finds himself uh, ever more frustrated um, that that Shabtaut is spreading, um, and the Rabbanim are not paying what he feels is sufficient attention to its dangers. Right, and and just finally on this, I mean this this ends up getting your Moshe Chajiz and the Chacham Tzvi kicked out of Amsterdam, essentially. Correct. Um, again, so the stakes were a little bit higher, if you if you will, for the Chacham Tzvi, uh, who was an official rabbi who had an official rabbinic position and lost it. Uh, whereas uh, for somebody like Rabbi Moshe Chajiz. Um, he never really held an official appointment in any of these communities. Uh, he was a wandering figure, and that made it a little bit more um, easy. It made it a little easier for him to take controversial stances. Um, anybody who who's a pulpit rabbi knows that there are certain certain political controversies that you just can't get involved in because. There are Stadim Lakan Lakan. Um, again, here it seemed like an open and shut matter. Uh, and yet it it was quite difficult for him to amass the kind of support he needed. And his letters are extremely vitriolic about um, the excesses of the Shaptaim. Uh, he tries several different ways, uh, some of which were already pioneered by Yaakov Sasportas, uh, to establish the uh, the heresy, if you will, of of his opponents. Uh, this is true both in this case and in other controversies that he led about uh, similar subjects, uh, where one of the tactics that he uses. Uh, is um, taking edus. He he take viat edut. He calls people who 
we're in the presence of a presumed chapter E. He says, what did they do? How did they behave? What was in their uh, manuscript? What did you see? Um, swear before a betin and write down the edus. And this way we have a fact on the ground. So they're creating a kind of trail or record um, which they can use to establish the correctness of their position. That's one of the things he does. Um, and the, and Cherem is another. Um, the First of all, the denial of Haskamot for their printed books. Uh, he went after every rabbi who had originally given a Haskamot to Chayon's work um, and tried to get them to recant and retract their Haskamot. Um, he, he felt that Haskamot in general were being given too liberally and people have to be more careful about um, what type of work they give one to. Okay, so this is how he would go about it. You're saying he would write letters and he was employing all these tactics in order to... to yes. Interestingly, something also you mentioned there about like how because he didn't have a position, he could do this. I mean, this is similar. He sounds pretty similar. Biakos Asportis was the same one until the end of his life, never held yes. a position. He was in, so there, well, are there similarities between the two of them? Absolutely. Um, that That's what I said in the beginning. The parallels are really striking in terms of coming out of uh, what we might call a Middle Eastern Jewish society that had certain, one of the things that both of them felt in the Western Sephardic diaspora was a lack of deference to Chachamim. Uh, they felt that in, in the, where they had grown up, uh, it, it was an almost automatic reflex that when somebody was a Talmud Chacham, they were accorded tremendous authority. Uh, when it came to the West, these were communities that were really founded and run by lay leaders, uh, people who, who really were not Torah scholars. Uh, some of them were descendants of conversos, and they did what they wanted to do. And um, they did not really appreciate when outsiders interfered with the way they ran their community. Okay, so just one more thing on, on Chayon to, to before we finish up on the discussion on him was, okay, so, I mean, you mentioned kind of, I guess, his background. He came from somewhere in the Middle East. We don't know exactly where, and he published these writings. I mean, did he publish more writings after this? And what happened, you know, I guess to him kind of after this controversy finished? So so the outcome of the affair um Chayon becomes a kind of hunted man. He was banned from many communities. Um, there is a reference somewhere to his being given food uh, by maybe, if I recall correctly, the wife of Reb Yonis and Eipschitz. Is that possible? I, I don't remember anymore. Um, but the, the bottom line is that uh, he wasn't welcome anywhere but that's not the point. The point was that with the opening of the Chayon controversy, almost a full century of further controversy, all of which um, centered on the question of Shabta'ut and whether the people who are labeled as Shabta'im can be accepted within the Jewish world or must be driven out because they represent a danger, a spiritual danger. Um, and that, that is a theme that comes uh, every 10 years in the life of Hajiz, so to speak, uh, 10 years later in Central Europe, uh, where he has a, a raging campaign against uh, what he sees as the growing attraction of Shabta'ut by uh, wandering preachers, uh, who are getting further and further into Eastern Europe, so uh, Poland in particular. Um, and then the Ramchal controversy famously in the 1730s. And then after Chajiz um, passes from the scene, the baton is taken up by Rabbi Yaakov Emden. And in the, by the 1750s, uh, we have the Eibschitz controversy. And then shortly after that, his controversy against the Frankists. Uh, which lasts right into the 19th century. Um, so, so we have a full century of, uh, again, almost every decade 
a new focus, but the same subject. It's, it's really interesting how this does not really subside as, as an obsession um, or as a danger, depending on which side you're looking at it from, uh, in the Jewish world in Europe for, for almost a full century, inaugurated anew by the Chayon controversy. So, I mean, how much, how truly prevalent was Sabatianism at the time? And how much of this was just like, to, to use the contemporary term, like McCarthyism? It seems like Ramosh Hajiz was like, you know, Joe McCarthy. He was like, was he just going after everybody? I mean, what was, the, what was exactly the story? So um, he wasn't going after everybody. Uh, the people he went after, for the most part, he had reason to go after. Uh, but at a certain point, and this question certainly comes up um, in the controversy over Ramchal, he did not have any evidence that Ramchal ever produced anything that was Shaptai. There, his concern was over what he saw as Chidush Nevua, um, uh, over a claim by Ramchal that he had a Magid who would come to him and who would um, teach him new Torah. And he saw this as a potential danger that was similar in some way to Shabtaut. And so, so he expands the definition of what he's after. Mm-hmm. So he, right, so I was gonna. So that's really what. what and and he and to be clear, he's the one that ignites the Ramchal controversy, really, right? Uh, to be absolutely clear, he is the one. Um, and in a certain way, you know, uh, I, I don't want to get into too many details because I understand you're going to do a separate session on that, uh, and um, with a person who's who's looked into it very closely. Uh, but I I just want to say that from somebody who who appreciates the genius, the spiritual genius of Ramchal, it seems like a crime was committed um, that that cut off this gift, this talent, this um, this life really before its time because Ramchal was hunted uh, out of Europe and on his way to Eretz Yisrael and eventually um, he dies uh, shortly after he gets there. Now, what uh, was... Go, go ahead. No, go ahead. No, so, you know, so that that's on the one hand. On the other hand, there will be those who say that if not for the vigilance um, and, and Ramchal's circle having to constantly look over their shoulder, you know, who knows in what direction their, their visions would have led them. So I'll leave it at that. Okay, right. And this is this is discussed in your book, The Other Controversy in Central Europe, yes. as well as the Ramchal Controversy, which, by the way, if I didn't mention, I'll put a link in the show's notes that uh, people can buy. I, I recommend I read the book uh, a while ago and I very much enjoyed it. So um, you, now regarding the Ramchal Controversy, especially is something where he kind of teams up, so to speak, with Rabbi Yaakov Emden. Rabbi Yaakov Emden is involved in that one. I mean, what was his relationship like with Rabbi Yaakov Emden? I mean, Rabbi Yaakov Tzvi, who was in the earlier controversy, the Chiyonon is really more, I guess, his contemporary. But what was, but did he have some sort of relationship with Rabbi Yaakov Emden also? So um, it was not a close relationship as far as I can tell. Uh, he does reach out to Rabbi Yaakov Emden, but it's early in Rav Yaakov Emden's life. And it seems, it's very interesting, but something has to trigger um, the, that zealous, controversial um, strain, both in Chajiz himself, but then also in Rabbi Yaakov Emden. He doesn't pick it up really in, this, in, in that early period, in the 1720s and 30s, um, he knows his father was embroiled and, and paid a very heavy price for it. Uh, he himself doesn't really become uh, deeply involved with it. Uh, Rabbi Yaakov Emden really saw himself as a continuator of the work of Rabbi Yaakov Sasportas, um, whose work he reprinted in, in brief, his polemical work. And um, so he doesn't he doesn't really join forces with Rabbi Moshe Chajiz at that time. Uh, his, own, his own zealousness comes to the fore almost uh, a decade and a half later. 
But it sounds like, I mean, that really, you know, Yaakov's support just mainly was just, you know, went after Shab Seitzvi, and after that he really stopped. But it sounds like Amosh Chajiz is really the one that starts off this whole, like I said, this whole century and all these attacks on all the other Sabathians or the alleged ones. It sounds like he's really the one that, that really starts this whole trend or this whole, you know, process, right? Right. So, um, it, you know, it's, it need not, it need barely be said that Rabbi Yaakov Sasportas was alive when the Shabtai Tzvi movement was a real messianic movement. It was a man who claimed to be the Mashiach. Um, he had a Navi, he had a retinue, he, he, and, and then he turned out to be a false Mashiach. He converted to Islam. There was no greater uh, disconfirmation than that. So, you know, he, he played his role. He saw himself vindicated. Uh, he does have another controversy with the lay leaders of Livorno, um, but that's not really over, over Shabtaut. And yes, uh, that's one of the things that attracted me to the study of Chajiz, uh, that here's a person who basically made it uh, one of the, the cornerstones of his life career uh, to, to root out this particular type of heresy, um, namely Shabtaut. And, and he, he sees it in many places because it has in fact spread to many places, although it's now not an overt messianic movement. There's no Messiah anymore. They, it's, it's rather a way of approaching certain Kabbalistic texts with a Shabtai twist. Uh, and the Poret Sterech, the first one, of course, was, was Natan, um, who, who brought the Kabbalah of, of the Ari into, um, into a certain type of thinking uh, about questions that had a specific answer um, that, Shab, that Shabtai was kind of necessary for. And then it evolves from there. Right. The other ones, I guess, after that, I mean, I know mentioned in your book, I had Professor Matt Goldish on, we discussed it. So it's been discussed the other, yes. the others that are kind of in middle and in between until we get to Chion and others. So I just want to, you know, end off discussing a little bit about Chajiz, about his works, because first of all, I mean, your book is obviously, like I said, terrific. But I mean, I don't know how much, how well he's known, especially by his Sfarim um, today. He has a number of Sfarim. You mentioned his father's safer that he printed, uh, his Katanas. But, which is available. It was a fa- very famous work, but he has his own farm. Mishas um, Chacham, I mentioned this to you before we started recording. I have one that was published about, I don't know, 15 years ago almost, but there was another new one printed again. I don't know if you want to speak about what that is. It's a very interesting safer, and there's a couple other ones we can talk about as well. So, um, yes, this was a person who was not only a one-note person. Mishnat um, Chachamim is, is a almost encyclopedic work in certain ways. But I think one of the key points in it is his critical stance toward the way Chachamim were were viewed in Western Sephardic circles. Um, And he demanded greater respect and felt that they were ought to be accorded greater authority than they were in fact given. Um, and it appears first in, in Wandsbeck uh, in the 1730s. And it, again, his, his works really don't, um, he, he has several that are polemical in nature, just anti shaptai um, Ela HaMitzvot, he has some that appeal to um, that are part of what you might call a genre for the Sephardic lay person to become better acquainted with Torah concepts and, and rituals. Uh, so that's, that's another aspect of his writing. I think uh, Leket HaKemach, right, is, is another one that's is somewhat interesting. That's the halacha. Yes. halacha. Leket HaKemach is a, actually a whole series of, um, that he has on, on several different, um, and then he has Perure uh, Pata Kemach. Uh, 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 so Kemach is Hakatan Moshe Chajiz, 
Um, others sometimes called him by a different acronym, Rav HaMeniach. Uh, that's what uh, Benayahu called him, Moshe Ibn Yaakov Chajiz. Right, and the Mishnah Chacham, I mean, it's on. He says, Dvarim Shatur Nikaspam, the Menchas Dvarim, but he only, he never, he never, he only did, I think, the first 24, right? He never finished it. He never actually finished it. That's not the whole thing. Yes. So, so that, like I said, there was a new edition. That's around. That might be, you know, of interest to, to listen. I, I, again, it's a, it's a wonderful work. I think one can one can gain a lot from it, uh, but it it harks back to his own sense uh, that there was not enough appreciation of Torah scholarship and its authority uh, in the world that he entered uh, compared to the one that he left. Right. Um, and I think I, I know other b- works from him. I think was uh, you, you'll tell there was uh, he, the letters that he wrote to Prashishim or Purgo maybe were published, right? I think those maybe were published at one point from manuscript. I seem to remember. Uh, but Again, not... he himself not collected. No, what? much later. Maybe video printed it. Someone printed um, huh. something about that related to the country. It's not, I don't remember. He himself printed lots of, of exchanges. And Ad Hayom Hazeb, more manuscripts are coming to light, uh, both about the Hayon controversy, about other aspects of his controversial dealings. Um, he, he was a prolific writer. Okay. So if anyone is interested in learning more about him or the controversies, I mean, obviously there's your book, which I said I'll put the link to. As there, as you're just, you know, all his works, I think, you know, are on Hebrew books. People should read his own works. Is there any other scholarship done otherwise? I mean, just, I mean, your book has it all. Just asking if there's any other suggested. Uh... Uh, well, my, my book is old um, and and um, I, I would have thought it would be outdated by now by somebody who would do a better biography of Hajiz. That hasn't happened yet, but maybe it will. Uh, so I will mention several things. Uh, again, anybody who's first coming to the study of Shabtaot, uh, which is hard to believe of any of your regular listeners, uh, should go maybe first to Sholem's Shabtai Tzvi, uh, now with the introduction by Jakob Dweck. Um, anybody who's interested in delving deeper into Shabtai thought might look at David Halperin's um, testimonies to a fallen Messiah. Uh, those who are interested in some pushback against Sholem Early on, should look at Moshe Idel's work, especially Kabbalah, New Perspectives. Uh, he has many other works which push back on various other aspects of Shalom's uh, work. Uh, Jakob Dweck's um, biography of Yaakov Sasportas, dissident rabbi. Uh, we all await the work of Rabbi Dr. Jacob Schachter on Yaakov Emd- Rabbi Yaakov Emden, the Mehera Biameno. Um, those who are interested in hearing more about the Frankist controversy, uh, besides the person um, who you interviewed, I would also recommend Harris Lenowitz's work uh, for an overview of messianism in this period. Um, he wrote a very accessible work called The Jewish Messiahs. And uh, Lenowitz also translated um, and edited uh, Jakob Frank's Divreha Adon, um, the Adon being Jakob Frank, and um, very, very interesting and worthwhile uh, to read. Then there's Pavel Masheko's The Mixed Multitude about the Frankists. Uh, you mentioned, um, I don't know if you mentioned Mark Baer's work on the Dunma. So, um, and I want to throw in one other title that I don't know if anybody has mentioned yet. Uh, and that is the late Ada Rappaport Albert's Women and the Messianic Heresy of Shabtai Tzvi. Um, she goes through several really interesting, um, uh, what you might call uh, sidelines, if you wish, uh, both um, the women who were married to Shabtai Tzvi, but also those who claim to have nevuot and visions uh, in in the wake of his movement uh, for a very long time, um, so you know she she did a lot of work on that, and it's a very interesting and and scholarly work. Okay, 
So, uh, like I said, I'll link to to your book and to uh, some of the other stuff in Hebrew books. And the other books, I think, either I'll link to or they were mentioned in the previous episodes. Link some of them, some not. We'll see what I end up linking to. And otherwise, people can email me if they're interested, if I didn't put up a link to remind me. And uh, with that, you know, thank you very much, Professor Kabbalah, for coming back once again and to uh, to discuss this. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It, it took me back many decades um, to uh, years that I spent uh, researching this and found it to be a fascinating period in Jewish history. So thank you for inviting me. Okay, thank you once again.